What he is doing in our midst, it is very much a privilege, as my sister, I believe, said. It is a privilege for us to be here, to form part of the kingdom of God, to be given the right to be called children of God, to be justified, yet we are sinners, as my brother said. And the grace of God is leading us and keeping us uh, remain faithful to his promises and to his calling. And that is something that we should cherish. And during the worship now, I had this desire when I was worshiping to see the face of Jesus. It came up to me, and, uh, and it, that says a lot for me. I mean, it's something, you know, it's like when you enter the presence of God, you will not remain the same person. You will change. And every time we do it, collectively or personally, God is changing us. He's transforming us. But God has also discipline for us. He has warnings, which are in Scripture. And even warnings that are happening around us in the world that we, we have to be listening to today. So it is not the hammering that the, the scripture does to us, but it is the love of God to lead us that we may remain faithful until the last day. I referred to yesterday's prayer meeting Saturday morning, seven until, from 7 till 8, which God is doing beautiful things in that time. And I, I urge you and I, I encourage you that if you may be present, uh, it will be a blessing. Because the more we are, um, uh, the better, because we are a blessing to each other. You agree? We all need each other. And... Uh, and what God is doing there is, is amazing. And the persecution of the church came up yesterday. And uh, I mean, rightly so, because what's happening in Afghanistan is headlines right now. Not because it is the only place that the, the Christian church is being persecuted, but, but specifically in Afghanistan, the church is being persecuted to the point of death to the point of the Christians being martyred. And I would like to share this post, which was posted by a brother here um, through a Christian radio station. Something that was ha is happening, that happened now, it's in the past, in the underground church in Kabul. And uh, the, the news says this. We received news that the underground church in Kabul, Afghanistan, has been martyred. Our friends have been in contact and met together last night in deep prayer. The last words she, she spoke about, of that this was a conversation happening at the time this happened, and one of the faithful ones said this. We feel your prayers because this supernatural boldness came over us and we were singing in the spirit. Even the kids said, mom, we will not deny Jesus. As they were on the phone, we heard screaming and gunshots. So at the point of death, 
even the children remained faithful. Isn't that something that should inspire us and should give us the a strength from inside to commit and recommit ourselves in our faith. Let us remind ourselves, brethren, from where Jesus brought us out. The first love, the first time that we met him, what did it feel like? I cannot ever, I can never forget that day. For me, it happened three o'clock in the morning in bed. I cannot, I can never forget that. And I'm sure that you have your own um, witness of this. And this miraculous feeling should be with us throughout our, our, our pilgrimage. We have to remain faithful, but because we are weak, we have to remind ourselves and go back into our first love, our first encounter with Jesus, that we might be renewed, that, that we might be um, uh, filled up again with the power of the Holy Spirit. Because there is a tendency that we restrict with our weakness what the Holy Spirit should be doing in our lives. Two Sundays ago, I focused my sermon on the qualities of the man of lawlessness. We brought out these qualities from Scripture and even the, the troubles that the disciples and the apostles were encountering in the, in the first century churches, that the source of these of this antichrist qualities was coming from the churches, was, was, were, were people that were in the churches itself. And that was a warning that we saw in 1 John um, uh, two weeks ago. And these qualities, I had put them in front of us for us to see that in the churches, there might be people who think that they are Christians, but will be disappointed when they come face to face with the Savior of the world. Do you remember that? That's what we talked about two weeks ago. Today, I'm going to take another perspective. This letter to the Thessalonians was based on Paul lifting up the people for being faithful, but warning those people who were um, sort of proclaiming or writing to the churches false information. This son of, per this son of sorry, the, the Antichrist, son of lawlessness, sorry, I got stuck there. Scripture calls this man of lawlessness the son of perdition also. The son of perdition it is a title given to him, but unfortunately, he is not the only person to be carrying that title. And I don't know if you can pinpoint another person in Scripture with the same title. Can you pinpoint another, another person in scripture who carries the same? Who said that? Judas. Yes, correct. Judas the Iscariot has the same title as the Antichrist. And uh, John 17, verse 12, I quote Jesus saying, While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of perdition, or the son of destruction, that this scripture might be fulfilled. That is a good point for us to look at. 
Jesus chose 12 apostles. Jesus spent definitely three years with them, teaching them the ways of the kingdom of God. But yet one of them failed to receive the message. And that is, I believe, in my opinion, it is that Judas the Iscariot or, and all the apostles had this, the best pastor, they had the best church, they had the best congregation. But just as yet, if the heart is not right, if the heart is not in receiving mode, if the heart is not open, the message will not go through. And that is not a failure of the teacher, the rabbi, Jesus Christ, but it was the failure of Judas the Iscariot. So can you imagine Judas receiving the best teaching you can get and yet failing to be saved? This is a point that we have to look at today, brethren, because Jesus practically lived and ministered with him. It was practically the grace of Jesus Christ melted down the hearts of the eleven. But just as yet, it hardened his, Judas. And we can compare this for us to understand how this happens. It's like when you see the sun, which is able to soften wax, but will, with the same source, with the same heat, harden clay. So, the same message of the gospel, depending on where your heart is, can soften your heart or can even harden it. This happened in the ministry of Jesus Christ, and it will continue to happen in the period of the church. That's what scripture is telling us. Yeah. Monstrous as this, this apost apostasy is, that Judas the Iscariot missed out salvation, it pales in comparison with what the Antichrist will commit. It is just irrelevant next to what um, Judas the Iscariot did. Judas betrayed the Son of God. Antichrist will proclaim himself God. Judas desecrated the temple with the money he received for betraying him. Antichrist will desecrate the temple by committing the abomination of desolation when he proclaims himself God and demands worship to him alone. Judas apparently, without influencing others, went astray, a tragic, solitary loss. But the Antichrist will lead the world astray into destruction. So, even though there is a place where to compare these two characters in Scripture, what will happen when evil will be handed over? into his power, the Antichrist's power, is out of this world. It cannot be compared to what Judas did. In fact, brethren, there is a good picture, another picture which Scripture shows us, that one of us in, in here in the church can end up in this same situation. And Scripture says this, very, very clearly. Two weeks ago, I shared a scripture with you and I said that this scripture gives me the chills. When Jesus, or else when a believer who thinks he's a Christian, faces Jesus and claims what he had done in his ministry to be a good barter for salvation. And Jesus rejected it. That scares me, and I believe it should scare us all. But here, 
Hebrews chapter 6 claims something else. Claims what can happen to a person who is a Christian. And I quote Hebrews chapter 6 from verse 4 to 8. And scripture says, For it is impossible. It is impossible, brethren. In the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away. To restore them back again to repentance. So it is impossible to be restored back to repentance if you reject your salvation. That's what Judas did. And we know how Judas ended up. Instead of him receiving the grace of God for healing, instead of going to the right priest for forgiveness, as Peter did, he went to commit suicide. This is a disciple who was chosen not only for salvation, brethren. One of the, dis the 12 disciples um, are a replica of the 12 tribes of Israel. And in Revelations, they are the 12 pillars that will support, ho will, will hold up the new Jerusalem. That's not a joke. Having a commitment like, having a calling like that, a commitment like that, and yet re rejecting it. And then, what did God do about it? He chose someone else to take his place. Matthias. What a tragic loss. Wouldn't it be a tragic loss if we were somewhere in the boundaries in the church, but not really going into being in Christ? And then at the end, we will lose everything. Isn't it a grace from God seeing a church like that in Afghanistan, in Kabul, being martyred and seeing them singing in the spirit just seconds before they were martyred, they were murdered. Isn't it something that should encourage us and fill us, fill us with strength so that we can not only be committed, but we frequently recommit ourselves because we have to be renewed every day because we have a sinful body. Because we are attracted to sin. Because our body is as it is. But the other thing is, we have Christ. We are filled with the Holy Spirit. We are the temples of the Holy Spirit. And in our lives, that has to be shown. We are the light. We are the salt. We should be the light and the salt. So if I am not committed, brethren, as a Christian, I will fail in my, in my time in, at work, anywhere during the day, to share the gospel. If I did not yet commit myself, if I did not yet start living, as God is calling me to live, I will not be able to give witness to someone else. So even that in its, in its case is a tragic loss because we are missing the purpose of God in our lives. So these are warnings. This letter, this is the same spirit, I believe, that Paul was writing this letter to the Thess Thessalonians. He was seeing 
And now we have the, we have the tools and we have the ability to see more because what was revealed through the Holy Spirit, we have it in Scripture. At that time, Paul was still in the process of um, building up the inspired Word of God. I mean, it was the Holy Spirit which, who was doing the work, and it took hundreds of years. But we, I continue a bit of this, the scripture I was reading. After it, after it, since they are crucifying, the reason is that they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. That is the result of someone seeing the light, receiving the grace of God, being saved, and yet does not act on it, does not commit himself on it, and eventually rejecting it. There will not be, Scripture says, another opportunity for repentance. That is another scripture that I have derived through the spirit of this letter. Thessalonians. We will be closing chapter 2 today. Instead of bearing fruit, scripture says, these people, they, they, they were bearing thorns and thistles, which were just worth of being burnt. So it's important, brethren, that we Examine ourselves. I am included in this. Don't worry. I passed through these scriptures when I was preparing the sermon, and it struck me it's not easy to hear these words. I know we are all in the same boat. We share the same problems. We are all in a way, outnumbered because people are, like, calling us names and, and trying to restrict what the Christians should be doing in the world. But we have something in common. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit. So let us, let us show that we have the Holy Spirit. It's not like I'm not telling you to go and, and laugh out loud like, you know, some, some I th sort of churches do when they receive the Holy Spirit, which is like not the Holy Spirit. It's like demonic when you see these videos about people um, turning into spastics when they receive the Holy Spirit. And there's no such thing. I mean, I, I know that you've seen them probably on, 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 on YouTube or on Facebook, but... The, the Holy Spirit does not work like that. Showing the Holy Spirit could be not even using words. I mean, it is like the way I live, the way I, I treat people, the way I hold to my faith, even if people mock me, even if people call me names, but I will just stand by my faith and if it's not the time to speak out, my actions will be enough. But God will give us time to speak out. And when God gives us the time to speak out, we have to speak out. That is what the Holy Spirit is trying to do through us. And sometimes we resist the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why we need to be renewed. That's why we need... To be filled up again with the Holy Spirit, because in the New Testament, when, when a person, a believer, receives the Holy Spirit, that is for good. And we are not going against Scripture here. But the, the, the thing is that with my spiritual laziness, I tend to restrict the power of the Holy Spirit in me, and I start to resemble the people in the world. Hmm... So I need a charge, a good charge. A good, I need to be renewed. And my commitment gives the space for God to renew me. So if I don't have a daily commitment with God, it's, uh, my participation in the church will be like 
Bleh. You know? But if we are living our faith at home, I mean at home, personally, I mean, and then when we come here, all that enthusiasm is joined together before God in worship and prayer and, and praise, then yes, we are the church there. But otherwise, we are dead bodies. And you know when we were dead bodies, when we had a dead spirit, when we were yet not saved. So let us start acting that we are part of the kingdom of God. Let us start acting that we are the children of God. Let us start acting that we are saved, that we have a principle, that we know what's right or wrong, and we, re we will reject sin personally and even in public. That is our calling. And I believe the spirit of Paul writing this letter to the church in Thessalonica is that he was so overjoyed by the brethren who were standing by their faith. They received, they were authentic believers, but then he was warning those members that were spreading lies. And members in the church in the first century were, this was a fact in the first century. And it is a fact today also, brethren. So I encourage you to, I let us encourage each other. I wanted to correct that. Let us encourage each other. If someone is not in his spiritual strength, you, you, you sense that let us give courage to each other. Let us, let us give strength to each other. Let us stand uh, shoulder to shoulder. Because Paul here is saying in the letter to the church, in the last part of this, of this um, paragraph, chapter, he is calling to the church to be vigilant. To be attent at, at, to have attention, to have open eyes. Be vigilant. Why? Because evil is all the time around us. Evil is around us. But we, we have to be vigilant and we have to know and remember that we have the Holy Spirit. We have the church. We have each other. We all need each other here. But even individually, our, our, pers our personal responsibility stands on us being vigilant and being committed to the gospel. Being thankful to God for his election. Let us thank God. Let us, let us go back into our honeymoon with him and, and just experience that again. And that will, give you spirit, that will give you spiritual life again. So... I'd like to conclude this sermon regarding this chapter 2 as Paul concluded with his two last verses, verses verse 16 and 17. And this is like an exaltation and a prayer mixed up together for the church, giving them courage because we all need um, to receive courage from one another, you know? It's like everyone is doing something in the church and we have to appreciate each other. We have to go to the person and say, I really appreciate you. I really appreciate your commitment. I thank God for you because you encourage me. I thank God for you praising God, for, for example, because it, that really encouraged me. I thank God for you being a worshiper. I thank God for you being whoever you, you are called to be in the church. Because that encourages us all. It builds us up. And I quote the last two verses. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us, and by his grace gave us 
eternal comfort and the wonderful hope comfort you and strengthen you in every good thing you do and say. In Jesus' name, I pray.